Hello and good morning everybody and welcome to the Scots Kirk. My name is Lindsay Griffiths. I was brought up in the Church of Scotland. I went to the Kirk every day at St. Serves Parish Church as it was called, Tillicourtry, in Scotland's smallest county, Clapmanninshire. I went every day with my mum and dad. But even then, there were few kirks in Scotland where the pure gospel was preached of salvation in Christ alone, the word of the Reformation. And so it's my heart's desire that God's put on my heart to pray and in every way speak the word of God of restoration and revival over the kirk. And I'm so happy that you're joining me today because we need restoration and revival in this kirk of ours. In the name of Jesus. Amen. So welcome to this morning service on the heart of the Covenanters. On the heart of the Covenanters and I want to begin now with a special prayer concerning Nek Tamen Consume Batur the burning bush the emblem of the church, the kirk in Scotland. So, Lord, in the name of Jesus, we dedicate this time, this special time to Thee. And we ask that Your presence, Your mighty fire, holy fire, will be with us this morning so that we can say, in the words that you gave, your words to Moses in the book of Exodus. Take off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the ground whereon thou standest is holy ground. Let this be holy ground to thee today, Lord. And let that bush burn with unquenchable fire this morning. And thank you for giving us this time together. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's begin the worship today with Psalm 84. I'm just going to read from the Word of God, the words of this psalm first before we sing. Psalm 84 verse 1 says, How amiable are thy tabernacles, O Lord of hosts! My soul longeth, yea, even fainteth for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh crieth out for the living God. And also especially on verses 9 to the end. Behold, O God, our shield, and look upon the face of thine anointed. For a day in thy courts is better than a thousand. I had rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold to them that walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the man that trusteth in thee. Let's sing it. O lovely is thy dwelling place, O Lord of hosts to me, the tabernacles of thy grace, a pleasant Lord they be. My thirst is so longs vehemently, yea, faints thy courts to see. My very heart and flesh cry out, O living God, for thee. Behold, the sparrow findeth out an house when to rest. The swallow also for herself hath purchased a nest. 
in I know no truth where she's safe her young ones forth may bring O thou almighty Lord of hosts who art my God and King Blessed are they in thy house that dwell they ever gave thee praise Blessed is the man whose strength thou art in whose heart are thy ways who passing through Bacchus vale therein do dig up wells also the rain that falleth down the pools with water fills so they from strength that we would go still forward on to strength until in Zion they appear before the Lord at length. Lord God of hosts, my prayer hear, O Jacob's God give ear. See God our shield, look on the face of thine anointed dear. For in thy courts one day excels a thousand, rather in my God's house will I keep a door than dwell in tents of sin. For God the Lord's a son and shield, he'll grace and glory give, and will withhold no good to them that uprightly do live. O thou that art the Lord of hosts, that man is truly blessed, who by assured confidence on thee alone doth rest. And that, dear brothers and sisters, the man of God who on thee alone doth rest. Those are the people of the covenant who we will be uplifted by looking at today. And it may surprise you to learn today that some of those people, and we're going to look at Welsh and Peden today, those men of God suffered for their faith so much. And yet, they were miracle workers through the grace of God, through the power of God running through them. They were true men of God. Our God is a supernatural God. Many people in the kirk now don't like to hear this. I wonder why. Could it be because the religion of good works has taken over? Could it be because the liberal higher critics have taken over? Seeing that Matthew Black, who was the professor of divinity in St. Mary's College, the principal of St. Mary's College of Theology, St. Andrews, when I was a student there in the late 1960s through to 1970, became one of the leading members of the Nessia Land Committee to corrupt the word of God and change its meaning. And as, as the spiritualist Westcott and Hort had done before him, Oh, Lord, we repent now for this awful, awful eating from the tree of knowledge. There was a tree. There is still a tree in the middle of St. Mary's College and St. Andrew's University. I think it was the tree of knowledge and not the tree of life, don't you? Oh, Lord. And the Masonic system that has taken over almost 
most of the church, that it's reared its head against the word of God. Our God is a miracle working God, a supernatural God. And isn't it interesting that one of those first things the Nestle Land Committee did was to take out the Great Commission, as in Matthew, sorry, Mark 16. I'm just going to read Mark 16 because it's quite relevant to what we're saying today about the heart of the covenanters. Our God is a supernatural God. He said, I am the Lord, I change not. He said, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today and forever. Just read this bit that's been missed out of so much, or doubt has been thrown on its authenticity in all the so-called new Bible versions. Mark 16. Afterward, verse 14, he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere. The Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Amen. You see, now you see why they took out the verse, Mark 16. They want us to think that this is just a dead church. That all these things have gone. All these things are nice, nice cessationist church. No miracles, no signs, no wonders, no power. Well, you look at the covenanters. In just a moment, we'll be studying them. I want you to look now with me at the book of Hebrews first. A small passage at the book of Hebrews that confirms a lot of what has been said already in Mark 16. This is Hebrews chapter 11, the book of faith. The book of faith. Great heroes of the faith. I'm going to look at two of them shortly, but let's start at verse 32. And he's just given a big list. The, the Lord speaking to the author of Hebrews, Paul, the apostle. And he now says, And what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and of Samson and of Jephthah, of David also and Samuel and of the prophets, who, through faith, Subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Now look at this. Women received their dead, raised to life again. And others were tortured, not accepting deliverance. Think of the covenanters as well, all these people of faith. The cloud of witnesses, because this is true of all of them. We're going to look at this. They are not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. Think of Psalm 84. I had rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord than dwell in the tents of wickedness. Verse 36, and others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskin and some goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. 
They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise, God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. Now that was then, you might think. But no, no. You look and see. In the 17th century, the killing times, and still today, these pe people of God are suffering those things, those exact persecutions. Final verse, Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. What is the Greek word for witnesses? Marturoi. Martyrs means witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin that doth so easily beset us. In other words, wake up. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the same, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Thank you, Lord. I bless you and thank you for giving us this holy word of God. And let it go forth as always, without, it never goes forth void. Let it go deep into the hearts of those who will see and hear this service, this program today. I'm going to read to you two of the names that were mentioned in the song we'll sing, perhaps at the end of this meeting, we've sung it so often, set Scotland now on fire. It talks about in the these days and days of your men loved the word of God. They preached it too and loved it too when Scotland was on fire. And we want that fire back. There was Welsh and Peton, it says, Craig and Knox, McShane and Rutherford, Bonner and Wishart, Livingston, they loved the word of God. So today we're going to look at, yes, amazingly, Welsh and Peton. This is awesome stuff. One of them raised someone from the dead through the power of God. Just like it said in Hebrews 11 at the end, women received their dead. And another was known and oh, really was a great prophet of God. So I'm going to read first from a wonderful book, which I really recommend to you, which we use a lot in our programs. It's called Healing Raised by George Jeffries, who was a great evangelist from South Wales, saved in the Welsh Revival of 1904, and became the founder of the Elam Movement. Yes, he's a Pentecostal. And guess what? A lot of this that I'm going to read now has been hushed up or regarded with great embarrassment by many people. But you know, the Holy Ghost moved in power on these two. And this is the heart of the Covenanters. This is chapter 10 of George Jeffrey's book. It's a short part here. Dispensation of the Holy Ghost continues, miracles and healings, and it's headed from Isaiah. Ye are my witnesses. Isaiah 14, I think it, no, 43, sorry, verse 10. It is impossible to read the thrilling records of these noble sons of Scotland, the Scottish Covenanters is the heading, given by the saintly John Howie and Scots worthies, without being inspired in our Christian faith. We shall never forget how, when ministering in the land of the Covenanters for the first time, our hearts were warmed as they reperused its soul-stirring pages. The names of Wishart, Knox, Welsh, Livingston, Craig and Peden on the roll of honour in the preface bring to remembrance impassioned prayers, noble deeds, enduring trials and triumphant faith. Their lives have been held aloft in Christian pulpits as examples of holy living, their heroic faith and passion of, for souls as blessings to be coveted. These illustrious saints believed in the God of the supernatural. 
And it is not surprising to know that divine interposition frequently attended their ministries. Yet, preachers, how true, have been strangely silent on the miraculous aspect of their ministry. It is because they have considered such, is it, sorry, because they have considered such startling answers to prayers impossible in modern times, probably. The following miracle, as a result of the importunate prayer of Welch, is recorded in this remarkable book, The Scots Worthies, page 293. Here's the extract from the book. There was in his house, amongst many others who boarded with him for good education, a young gentleman of great quality and suitable expectations, the heir of Lord Ochiltree, captain of the castle of Edinburgh. This young nobleman, after he had gained very much upon Welch's affections, fell ill of a grievous sickness, and after he had been long wasted with it, he, to the apprehension of all spectators, closed his eyes and expired. He was therefore taken out of his bed and laid on a pallet on the floor that his body might be more conveniently dressed. This was to Welch a great grief, and therefore he stayed with the dead body full three hours, lamenting over him with great tenderness. After twelve hours, the friends brought in a coffin and desired the corpse might be put into it as the custom was. But Welch requested that for his satisfaction they would forbear it for a time. This was granted, and they did not return till 24 hours after his death. They then desired with great importunity that the corpse might be coffined and speedily buried, the weather being extremely hot. The good man still persisted, however, in his request, and earnestly begged them to excuse him once more. So they left the corpse upon the pallet for full 36 hours. But even after that, as he urged not only with great earnestness, but with some displeasure, they were constrained to forbear for 12 hours more. After 48 hours were passed, he still held out against them. And then his friends, perceiving that he believed that the young man was not really dead, but under some fit, proposed to him for satisfaction that trials should be made upon his body, if possibly any spark of life might be found in him, in to which he agreed. The doctor accordingly were set to work. They pinched him in the fleshy parts of his body and twisted a bowstring about his head with great force, but no sign of life appearing. They pronounced him dead. And then there was no more delay to be made. Yet Welch begged of them once more that they would but step into the next room for an hour or two and leave him with the dead youth. And this they granted. He then fell down before the pallet, doesn't it sound like Elijah, and cried to the Lord with all his might, and sometime looking upon the dead body, he continued to wrestle with the Lord, till at length the youth opened his eyes and cried out to Welch, whom he distinctly knew, Oh, sir, I am whole, but my head and legs, these were the places hurt with the pinching. When Welch perceived this, he called his friends and showed them the dead man restored to life again, to their great astonishment. This young nobleman, though he lost the estate of Ochiltree, lived to inherit not one inferior to Ireland, in Ireland. And so it goes on. The story the nobleman himself communicated to his friends in Ireland. Isn't it wonderful? What a miracle, the heart of the covenanters. Such perseverance over all these hours, such faith in the word of God raised him from the dead. Oh, thank you, Lord, for the life of this wonderful man of God, this covenanter Welch, who's still remembered in the names of the witnesses, the martyrs. And we thank you for him, Lord. And we thank you that these things are still 
according to the word of God, true today. And we ask that you will also raise up the kirk from the dead today, Lord. As we said before, it's like the church at Sardis had the name that it liveth and is dead. Raise up that body of yours, Lord. We thank you, Lord, to make it your true body once more in Scotland. I am he that liveth and liveth with, and was dead, saith the Lord. Behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and hell. The last enemy. And everything, all things are possible to him that believeth. Amen. Amen. Let's look at the life of Alexander Peter. And this is such a, a, a man of God. And it, and it really touches my heart. I'm sure he'll touch your heart hearing about this. He was known as the prophet Peden. What a man. Man of God. Alexander Peden was born near Sorn, Ayrshire, about 1626, educated at the University of uh, Glasgow. And eventually, in 1660, he became ordained as the minister of New Luce, which isn't actually very far away from here. And there's an abbey not far away from there called at Glen Luce. This is New Luce, away in the hills of Galloway, above Stranraer. So he was deprived of his charge, though, in 1662, when new laws, evil laws, came in from Charles II's time, which meant that over a third of the ministers of the Kirk felt compelled to leave their charges, leave their livings, leave their mans, leave their congregation without a minister. And he was one of them. He became, after he was thrown out, he became perhaps the most celebrated field preacher of his time. On 25th of January, after he wandered the hills preaching to covenanters at conventicles and all these things, he was denounced as a rebel. Very, very sad. He fled to Ireland, but in 1673 he was arrested while he was preaching at Ballantrae Parish and sent to the Bass Rock. You see, in prison, the Bass Rock, for those who know you of it, perhaps you don't all know of it, is what's called a, vulcan a volcanic plug. It's an, a rocky, barren <laughs> rock. There's no other word for it. Um, there's one at Ailsa Craig off the west coast and the Bass Rock on the east coast. All it is is a pile of cliffs, most forbidding place. Many covenanters were in prison there. There was hardly any fresh water. A terrible, terrible, barren place. So he was sentenced instead uh, to this for over three years he lived there. Then he was imprisoned in the toll booth in Edinburgh. And finally, together with 60 others, he was sentenced to perpetual banishment. That meant he had to go and work as a, just like a slave, an indentured worker, a slave, like many others from Scotland were sent there and from Britain, to work in the colonies in uh, Virginia, I think, or the plantations in the southern states. Now, he did say... You see, he was known as a prophet. And he did say to his companions, once we get to London, as long as we get to London, everything will be all right. And sure enough, they sailed to London. And the American captain of the ship there that was due to take them overseas, he refused to take them. He had been told they were terrible criminals. And he found out they were actually mighty men of God, women of God. So he wouldn't take them on board. So from London, Peden managed to get back to Scotland. Amazing history of escaping. Uh, the godly man was preserved of God, definitely. So he returned to Ayrshire from Ireland in 1685. 
And there he preached his last sermon at Collinswood on the Water of Ear. Remember that by then he was nearly 60. And he was worn out from all his sufferings. So what did he do? He wanted to stay for his last days in his native homeland, Ayrshire. So he found shelter in a cave. What did it say in Hebrews 11? They wandered about deserts and caves. And he landed up in this cave near Thorn, his birthplace. And went to his brother's house one day in Thorn, where he died. He must have known he was going to die. On the 28th of January, 1686, he was buried in the Boswell Isle of Ochenlek Church. And 40 days later, it's awful this, a group of dragoons lifted his corpse, carried it to Cumnock, another place in Ayrshire, to the gallows, and tried to hang it there, but it didn't work. So they buried it at the foot of the gallows. This is what they did, you know, they dug up people's bodies, desecrated them. Anyway, the people later reburied him because they loved him so much. He was the most eminent and revered of all the Scottish covenanting preachers. And his influence upon the people was so great that they themselves gave him the name, the prophet. So, you know, I said to you that for years and years he managed to escape his captors and continue to preach and build up his people. Uh, one of the things that he did, this is very famous, most unusual man, he made a cloth mask, a face with real hair and a beard, and it was his disguise, that, and a wig, if you like, and this mask is still, still displayed to this day in Edinburgh's museum in Scotland. So sad, but... In 1891, finally, a monument was built on the spot in his honor. Prophet Peden is talked about a lot in a book, and I haven't read this book. It's a book by Jack Deere, which you must get surprised by the voice of God, which talks about his prophetic giftings. This is one example. In 1682, Peden performed the wedding ceremony of a man called a covenanting couple, John Brown and Isabel Weir. He told Isabel after the ceremony, you have a good man to be your husband, but you will not enjoy him long. Prize his company and keep linen by you to be his winding sheet, for you will need it when you are not looking for it, and it will be a bloody one. Well, on the night of 30th April, 1685, troops commanded by the infamous John Graham of Claverhouse, one of the worst, most infamous persecutors of the Covenanters, shot John Brown for his refusal to take the oath of abjuration. That's the one which said the king was the head of the church in all matters. But also they found a Bible in his house and a weapon as well. So what they did, they shot him in front of his wife. Terrible. The story is that we don't really know what happened after that, but we do know that Peden was 11 miles away at the time, praying with the family of John Moorhead in his home, Muirhead. And this is what he prayed. He didn't know anything about what had happened in the natural, but he knew in the spirit. Lord, when wilt thou avenge Brown's blood? Oh, let Brown's blood be precious in thy sight. See, he was an intercessor as well as a prophet. Peden told them of his vision of Brown's wife weeping over his corpse and of Claver House killing John Brown. Isabel Brown buried her husband in the sheet that she had saved. Peden was well known for God's spectacular answer to his prayers. That is the heart of the covenanters. And God honored them. These two examples I've given you with miracles, signs and wonders following the preaching of the word, but it came at a great price of suffering. Oh Lord,
Lord, we thank you for this day today. Let this, your Holy Spirit today, your spirit of power arise once more. Power, love, and a strong mind instead of fear. Fear of God instead of fear of man. Miracles, signs, and wonders following the preaching of the true word and the conviction of the true Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, fall upon the kirk right now. Oh, Jesus, thank you, Lord. And to finish now, let's sing a wonderful hymn, which is about Jesus, our great example, who himself made himself as as nothing left it's called thou didst leave thy throne and thy kingly crown when thou camest to earth for me and it just let it touch your heart and pray the chorus make the chorus a prayer oh come to my heart lord jesus there is room in my heart for thee Die to yourselves today, the fear and the insecurities and the anxieties and all the rubbish that's been fed to us through this education system and all the media lies that have been told us. And look to him, Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. <laughs> Thou didst leave thy throne and thy kingly crown When thou camest to earth for me But in that place home where there was found no room For thy holy intimacy Oh, come to my heart, Lord Jesus There is room in my heart for thee You have to forgive me, it's so anointed this hymn Heaven's heart is rang when the angels sang, proclaiming thy royal degree. But of lowly birth did thou come to earth and in great humility. Oh, come to my heart, Lord Jesus, there is room in my heart for thee. The fox is for rest and the birds their nest in the shade of the forest tree. But thy couch was the soil, O thou Son of God, in the deserts of Galilee. Oh, come to my heart, Lord Jesus, there is room in my heart for thee. Thou camest, O Lord, with the living word that should set thy people free. But with mocking scorn and with crown of thorn, they bore thee to Calvary. Oh, come to my heart, Lord Jesus. There is room in my heart for thee. When the heavens shall ring and the angels sing at thy coming to victory, let thy voice call me home, saying, Yet yeah, there is room, there is room in my side for thee. My heart shall rejoice, Lord Jesus, when thou comest and callest for me. That's the commitment he wants from us. That is a hymn of conviction. I can't even sing it. Dear viewers and listeners, I can only speak it. It is such a beautiful hymn. Let's get that heart back of the covenanters. Let's give everything to him. 
He let's take up our cross and really mean it. The new, not the new cross, but the old rugged cross. Let's follow Him today. And then miracles, signs, and wonders will again return to the church. The true word will return to the church. The true spirit will return to the church. We will see a great awakening and a great revival. Oh, and to sit in prayer today. Don't be afraid to cry. The anointing is the anointing that breaks the yoke. Don't be afraid to do this. It's tears of the saints and the blood of the martyrs the prayers and the intercessions that will revive God's church and revive this nation of Scotland and those who are in Scots Kirks all over the world God bless you today keep your hearts pure just look to him. Keep your faith high and walk tall with him. And remember the examples of Welch and Peter and all the others mentioned in the word of God. And above all, Jesus himself, who endured the cross despising the shame for the joy set before him. Hebrews 11. Goodbye and God bless you too. See you next week. Bye.